You guys have heard in previous classes that when you actually make a measurement of some light at a detector, that the intensity of the light, the power per unit area, something like that, is proportional to the square of the electric field. So you, in 261, you saw a lot of calculating a field, like for interferometry, but then when you talked about the power that would be measured, you would square that, and that would get you the measurable quantity. So we can now start defending this statement uh, in the language electromagnetism, and let's do that right now. We start with the idea, as we have with many other things, of there being a volume represented by V, and we're going to talk, first of all, about this, this closed volume having a surface, and that there is energy that's flowing through this surface with respect to time. So as we often do, we're going to write, just to relate to that, a little patch on the surface, and we can talk about a differential surface area element, d sigma, and at that same location, we can associate at that point in space, perhaps not normal to the surface, there is some flow, and we're going to call that energy flow S, the pointing vector, and the uh, units of S are going to be energy per second, or power, per unit area. So this derivation is going to be about getting an expression for the pointing vector in terms of the electric field and magnetic field at this location. So how do we do that? We're going to start by thinking about energy conservation in a general sense for this volume. So let me write a statement here. I'll just make it appear now. So what we'll say, we can refer, we can think about the energy contained within volume V, and we can think about the energy that's leaving, that's le leaving volume V. And what we can say is that there should be some conservation here. We, should say, we can say that the time rate of change of the energy within volume V plus the time rate of change of the energy leaving volume V has got to equal zero. Basically, whatever goes in has to be accounted for by something going out. If the amount of energy within the volume V increases, the amount of energy leaving volume V must decrease, which is the same as saying energy flows into volume V. Well, this pointing vector allows us very quickly to write an expression for what the total energy per second, right, d by dt of energy, that's energy per second, leaving volume V. We just integrate the pointing vector over the entire surface. So this term becomes the integral over the surface of V of the pointing vector dotted into d sigma. The energy within volume V is more complicated. There's three different energies in here. If I rewrite this as just copy over d by dt. The three energies within volume V that we need to think about are electric field energy and there's magnetic field energy and then there is charge flow energy and I will now just talk about each three of these things. So here's our equation continuing on. So electric field energy, we've heard of that before from charging up a parallel plate capacitor. Uh, the energy stored when here's a parallel plate capacitor connected to some wires, and you know that there can be an electric field built up inside of a parallel plate capacitor. We're not going to drive that here, but what comes out of that fundamental result there, E field energy, energy density inside of a parallel plate capacitor, that we will call U sub E. That's energy per unit volume. And that is something that's been solved for in freshman mechanics, in freshman E and M classes. And it's equal to one half epsilon naught and then the square of the electric field, which 
for future purposes, I'm going to write as E dotted into itself. Magnitude electric field squared. Magnetic field energy, the problem you did in, opti in physics 122 or 142, it's related to that, is the electric field inside of a coil of wire, a solenoid. And inside of a solenoid, there's a, magnetic, there's a magnetic field pointing along the axis of the solenoid. And there's an analogous expression for the stored energy inside the solenoid. Thinking of that as energy per unit volume, U sub B has very parallel form. It's equal to one half, there's a fundamental constant, mu naught, and then it's B dot B. So very similar to the electric energy density. And then there's charge flow energy, which I'm going to put off for a second. So if I start writing the first two terms, these are energies per unit volume. If I, to get the total energy, I have to integrate over the volume. And then I have to take the time derivative of that. So that starts looking like this. I have then an integral of 1 half then the epsilon naught is just a constant but I take the time derivative of e dot e and 1 over mu naught the time derivative of b dot b and in order to get the total energy inside of this volume up here I've got to integrate these energy densities over the entire volume V. So there's my integration over V. So that's, so far, this takes care of the first two terms up here. What about the charge flow energy? Well, the charge flow energy, that comes from the fact that there are charges inside, possibly, of this volume. And as electric fields act on them, it can speed them up or slow them down. So there's pushing going on. And it's the, f the speeding up or slowing down of those charges that gives us charge flow energy. Now, another result that we have from, from mechanics is that mechanical power, which is what we're talking about here. We're talking about moving the charges around. Power is force dotted into velocity. I'm not going to dwell on that here, but the more force you apply to something and the faster that thing is going, the more power you're delivering to it. Or if you're opposing its velocity, then you are subtracting energy from the system. So in this case, we have a lot of charges. Each, If we think about a little amount of tar charge dq, the, fee the force upon that charge due to the, the electric field is dq times E, and that's the fundamental definition of how electric fields generate force, electric field applied to a charge. And if we dot that into velocity, we get a little amount of power. And if I just re-scramble these terms, I can write this as E dotted into DQ, uh, V dQ. And a little bit of charge traveling at a certain speed is like a little current. And I, so I can rewrite this as E dotted into current density J integrated over a volume. So I've got, again, a, different, a differential amount of charge. This becomes a differential amount of force. This VDQ, grouping it that way, this becomes a differential amount of something related to current, not quite with units of current. And when you keep the units the same, that becomes E dot J integrated uh, times this differential amount of volume. This expression already has units of power, which is rate of change of energy. It's already got the right units. We just have to integrate this over all of the little charges. In other words, integrate over the entire volume. And I've got uh, the total change in charge flow energy. So I've already got an integral of two other terms over volume. I'll just add this third term that's also being integrated over volume. And now I've got a full expression here for these three terms here. So let me just draw some, uh, some enclosures here. So what I'm saying is that 
these three terms enclosed in blue, the change of energy within the volume, has, can also be written as this. It's these, these three terms all being integrated over dV. I suppose I should really write another integral sign here because I already wrote the dV over there. So I've got these three terms. All these three terms plus the turn from up, up here, just bring it down, plus the integral over volume, over the, sorry, over the surface of s dot d sigma, that all still has to add up to zero. If I now simply clean up this last line, I get the following, and I'm just going to make this appear. So what we've got is a single volume integral. This is the integral over all the energy within the volume, and this integral represents the rate of change of the energy within that volume. And the right-hand side, we have a single term, which is the amount of energy flowing out of the volume. The minus sign keeps track of the fact that we move this to the other side of the equation. But again, this whole expression is simply saying that the rate of change of the energy within the volume is balanced by the rate of change of energy flowing out of the volume. Let me move this stuff up to the top and keep going. Okay, so now the equation's back up on top with some space. Now, now, we ha now comes some stuff that you're going to be doing on one of your homeworks. There's a lot of action going inside of here, and there's a lot of simplification that can be made. And here are some things that you'll do, just to say, you're going to eliminate J, and you're going to do that using the Maxwell's equation that has a J in it. And that, the Maxwell equation with J is the curl of the magnetic field, because that equals mu naught J plus a second term. So that'll get rid of the J. We're not going to have a J in our final answer. And you also use uh, a handy vector identity. That's going to come, and the, the vector identity that you're going to get comes directly from this e dot j because you're now going to have e dotted into j because the j is going to, when you substitute for j you're going to get a del cross b so one of the terms you're going to get is e dot del cross b and a vector identity that's very useful here is that the divergence of a cross product which I will uh, just use two vectors g and h can be written in the following way uh, h dotted into the curl of g minus g they switch roles g dotted into the curl of h so again, E dot J is going to give you an E dot curl of B, and that looks like this, E dot curl of B. So that vector identity is going to be useful. So dot, 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 you go through some lines of math, and it turns out that this whole mess in here can be written as it simplifies out. A lot of terms cancel each other, and you get a negative sign out in front, and it becomes the negative divergence of this fairly simple quantity, 1 over mu naught E cross B. This form, the divergence of a cross product, comes from using this vector identity. You see here we have the divergence of a cross product. So the integral of this quantity over that volume all, again, all of this white stuff collapses down to being this single term. Well, that still equals this surface integral. So we're still talking about the ch rate of change of energy inside the volume here being balanced by the rate of change of energy flowing through the volume. But now, as we've seen so many other times in this course, when you have the divergence of a quantity integrated over a volume, Gauss's theorem says that that can be written 
as the integral of the thing that's having its divergence taken, which is E cross B, with the mu naught out in front, it's going to be that thing integrated over the bounding surface. And now just bringing this over, that equals, and this is a surface integral, so I'll write a circle there to emphasize it's a closed surface. It's equal to the integral of the pointing vector. And now, as is again so often in the course, we have two quantities, this and this, whose surface area integrals over, that, over any arbitrary surface that we could have chosen are always equal. Therefore, these two integrands must be equal, and we even have minus signs out in front that cancel each other. So this gives us a final result that S, the pointing vector, is, is simply given by 1 over mu naught, which is just a units conversion, really, and then the cross product of E and B. So this is a very significant result. It tells us that the power per unit area at any point in space can be gotten by taking a cross product of the electric and magnetic fields. So we've now got that power per unit area seems to scale with the amount of E times the amount of B. And it turns out that E and that the magnetic field is linearly proportional to the electric field in the case of plane waves and the sort of things we'll be studying in this class. So for optics 262, this means that the power unit area is proportional to E times E, I'm not talking about a cross product here, I'm just writing a simple time sign, which equals E squared. So we eventually find that the magnitude of the pointing vector is proportional to the magnitude of the electric field squared, which is what we were starting out to say up here.